So I'm calling the meeting to order. Declare the meeting open to the public. Can I remind members that the committee uh, meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. I want to advise you that there are currently four of us attending um, in total. We've got three members in person and one member attending via Starleaf. So in person we have myself, Emma Sheeran, we've got Mike Nesbitt, the Vice Chair, and Michelle McElveen. And via video conference and we currently have Mark H. Durkin. We're expecting Paula Bradshaw and John O'Dowd has given notice that he will be in hour late, so he'll be joining via Starleaf um, at three o'clock. So we don't have any apologies, um, so we'll maybe just keep an eye on that as the meeting, because we might have we might have Christopher uh, joining us as well. We haven't got any apologies. So agenda item two, we've got a briefing today by Professor Christopher McCrudden. Um, on behalf of the Human Rights Consortium on its report to Economic and Social Rights in Northern Ireland, Models of Enforceability. And today we're going to be hearing from Kevin Hanratty, Director of the Human Rights Consortium, and Chris McCrudden, Professor of Human Rights and Equality Law in Queen's. So if you want to begin, um, you can find the pack, you can find the, the papers from page five in your pack. So Christopher and Kevin, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate your patience. And if you want to begin your briefing. Everybody there can hear us? Am I muted? Do we make with an arrow through it? Hello. Hello. Hi, Hello. Kevin. Hi, are you, Chris? I don't know if you if you caught that, but um, you're free to start your briefing. Oh, sorry. So I, I think I might have been muted there. I'm not sure if I still am, but if you can hear me now, you can begin your briefing whenever it sits in. That's great. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, good afternoon to the committee, and, and thanks to the committee for the invitation to myself and Chris to give evidence today. Our plan was that I would start by giving some quick background context to the research report that we've just launched and wanted to talk about today. And then Chris would give an overview of the models that have been developed in that report, if that's okay. Um, so I represent the Human Rights Consortium, which is a coalition of over 160 member groups from across Northern Ireland, um, from various communities and sectors. And historically, um, the unifying factor in the consortium as a coalition it has been the idea of the creation of a, of a human rights based society and fundamental to that really has been the idea of, of an instrument such as the bill of rights uh, envisaged under the good friday agreement to deliver that type of society so we've really i suppose been to the fore in arguing and advocating for the creation of that bill of rights for northern ireland ever since the good friday agreement was was signed um, which is why I suppose over the last 10 years we've been quite frustrated by the lack of progress in delivering on that, that Bill of Rights, but it's also why we're quite um, glad to see this committee in operation and we uh, wanted to start really by wishing you well in your work and hope that we can assist in your deliberations and we would obviously like to see at the end of this process recommendations that would move, move us closer towards the achievement of, of what we would call a strong and inclusive rights for Northern Ireland. Um, so obviously your discussions are really starting uh, from, from scratch. We know there have been numerous consultations and engagement opportunities historically, and we have the Human Rights Commission's advice. So where we'd like to sort of um, sort of play a role is, is trying to add value to some of the debates and conversations that have happened to date. And I suppose for us, one of the ways in which we've seen that the process uh, and dialogue break down historically is around, um, at least at a political level, is around sort of the, the, the conversation around inclusion of economic and social rights within that Bill of Rights and the manner in which, which they, they could be enforced. I suppose it's worth outlining, outlining that for us, we um, would rights having sort of uh, various strands of enforcement, including a, a judicial element as, as, a, as, a, as a method of last resort and the backstop in case the sort of legislative and executive functions fail to protect fundamental economic and social, social rights. And I suppose that's replicated in some of the debates, including the, the Commission's uh, advice in 2008 as well. At a political level, we've we almost uh, were really, I suppose, stuck with, with two models of what enforcement and what economic and social rights would look like uh, within the model of a Bill of Rights. On one hand, we had the idea of declaratory principles where the rights would be declared but no real enforcement mechanism. And on the other end of the spectrum, we would have um, full legal enforceability um, through the courts 
as, as a mechanism, to, I suppose, again, akin to some of the, the recommendations from the Human Rights Commission. And there wasn't really much explore, exploration of, of, of the options in between or how different pieces from different jurisdictions could be utilized to, 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 to build upon either the advice of the, of the Human Rights Commission or to remove some of the anxieties that people had about uh, the idea of enforceable social and economic rights. And really, that's where this report comes into play. We, we didn't commission it recently. We commissioned it a couple of years ago. Um, but I think it plays very well into the sort of the process that you're going through now, because fundamentally what it does is looks it looks at that middle sort of ground up middle sort of spectrum uh, between the two sort of declaratory principles on fully enforceable rights. It looks at the middle of the spectrum and what options are available in terms of enforcement within oh, within the, within that uh, that spectrum of options. And really, for us, what it does is put is create food for thought and creates options and I suppose a suite a toolkit of, of of ideas that you and the committee or us in civil society or beyond can really uh, take on board and maybe try and digest in terms of creating uh, greater dialogue, creating uh, greater, I suppose, creativity, I suppose, around the idea of how we enforce social and economic rights that could, add, that could add value to what the Commission have already put out there into the public domain. So it's our hope that in, in sort of developing and commissioning this report, and we're very thankful to the role of Chris and his team at Queen's and beyond for doing this, that it would, uh, would, uh, will add value to the debate that we've had to date and hopefully create more options for us as we discuss the Bill of Rights and hopefully move towards towards creating that Bill of Rights. So I'll leave it at that and I'll ask Chris maybe to go into more detail about the actual models themselves. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, well, with your permission, Chair, um, what I'd like to do is to share my screen and just go through some uh, bullet points on a, on a PowerPoint. Um, is that okay with you, Chair? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I think perhaps the starting point that uh, um, Kevin began with uh, is, uh, is really important uh, in terms of the, the motivations behind it. Um, what I'd like to do initially is just to sketch out um, what we're talking about when we're talking about economic uh, and social rights. Um, and the, uh, the definition here that we've taken from the Office of the High Commissioner for, for Human Rights is, is a good starting point. So economic, social, and they've added cultural rights, I'll come back to that in a minute, include the rights to adequate food, to adequate housing, to education, to health, to social security, to water and sanitation, and to work. So fairly comprehensive um, uh, set of what we might call bread and butter issues. Uh, we, weren't, we were not asked by the, um, by the Human Rights Consortium to consider cultural rights um, not least because uh, I think they raise somewhat different questions. So we're really focusing here in this report on the economic um, and, and social rights element. Um, so the starting point here is that we already have um, a lot of these rights in the United Kingdom. Um, the United Kingdom has signed up to and ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So you're well aware of that and of the Council of Europe's uh, European Social Charter. So there are a set of international obligations uh, that the United Kingdom has taken on with regard to these economic and, and social rights, some of which, of course, are specifically um, protected by elements of, of national law, of, of uh, UK law, whether it be the common law or, or statute law. We only need to think about the extensive um, legislation dealing with housing or dealing with um, questions of education um, or of social security. So we're not starting from a, um, a blank sheet of paper here. The debate, rather, is how to make these rights that are set out in um, texts like the International Covenant, how to make them more effective in practice and, and to prevent uh, regression. And in the context of the debate about the Bill of Rights, which is obviously your primary focus, uh, Chair, in that context, as Kevin has said, there are two main contrasting approaches that are often identified. Uh, and as he said, uh, sometimes declaratory principles are thought to be adequate, um, whereas for others, full enforceability um, seems to be the, the name of the game. And what we were asked to do, um, as Kevin has said, is to identify methods of enforcing um, or providing for economic social rights in Northern Ireland that span the, the middle of that spectrum, as it were, between 
um, the declaratory principles and full enforceability. So the purpose of doing that is, as Kevin has also said, is to simulate debate about how these economic and social rights could be better delivered, even if the approach of full justiciability isn't adopted. And we were asked to be innovative and creative. So the authors here I've, I've listed, a team from, uh, from Queen's, um, our position essentially is that the models that I'm just about to set out here um, are um, for debate. Um, we don't take a position on whether full justiciability should be adopted, um, nor do we rule out any other constitutional type reforms. Um, equally, in terms of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission advice, which you're well aware of, we, we neither endorse nor reject those proposals. And nothing that we're suggesting here gets in the way of enacting those uh, principles if that should be um, the committee's decision. So we're essentially in attempting to bring in um, alternatives um, for the purposes of um, making the debate clearer on what might be encompassed. So lots of contexts which are set out in the report, but I, I'll, I won't delay further and I'll discuss the five models. And these are the, the lists of, of the models here. And as I say, we're envisaging these as being in between um, the de simple de declarations um, of support for, for economic social rights on the one hand and full justiciability um, or full enforcement on, on the other. And model one, um, which I'll, each of these I'll, I'll talk about in, in a little more detail, is what we're calling pre-legislative scrutiny. Second is what we're calling a piecemeal approach, which would be to include socioeconomic requirements in specific legislation. Third is what we're calling fundamental non-justiciable but constitutional duties. Fourth is progressive implementation um, through, for example, a planning obligation um, with light touch judicial review. And the fifth is trade conditionality. So to repeat, we're not ranking these models in terms of their political effectiveness, uh, political feasibility or effectiveness. Um, we're simply uh, identifying them uh, as leading candidates um, for um, this middle of the spectrum type of approach. And we've adopted essentially a comparative approach drawing on pretty extensive experience from Canada, Republic of Ireland, India, South Africa, uh, among others, as you'll see in the report itself. So the model's in, in a bit more detail. Um, so pre-legislative scrutiny was the first, the first model that we suggested. And that would involve essentially placing responsibility for dealing with economic social rights on local politicians. Um, so the primary emphasis is on political obligation here, obligations on local politicians, um, to be essentially reminded every so often of the international uh, legal obligations to implement these rights. And one way of doing that would be to establish, probably through a change in the standing orders of, of the Assembly, an additional committee charged with regular pre-legislative scrutiny of bills going through the Assembly for compliance with economic social rights. A bit like the obligation on the Westminster Parliament um, to certify that ministers introducing legislation um, should, are in compliance with the European Convention on, on Human Rights. So we're anticipating that that type of scrutiny um, could stimulate ministers or civil servants um, to take these kinds of rights more seriously in the context of considering policy options. It might also involve an amendment to the current ministerial code for, for Northern Ireland ministers and perhaps with particular targeting of the budgetary process. That's model one. Model two, um, including socioeconomic requirements in specific legislation. So the idea here essentially is quite simple, that you would uh, insert references to uh, economic and social rights in specific pieces of assembly legislation, or indeed Westminster legislation, applying to, to Northern Ireland. So one example, for example, would be that was put to us would be including in Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act um, an amendment which would include something like socioeconomic status as one of the grounds subject to the mainstreaming requirements of Schedule 10 of the Act. Um, so applying a due regard duty in, in that context. And that would mirror what has been going on, particularly in Scotland and Wales, where the equality duty has been expanded 
um, to include um, socioeconomic status or, or an equivalent. Now, the point of uh, just a, a brief uh, footnote, um, the, the point of these models is not um, to suggest that any of them are costless um, or uh, are, um, don't have difficulties associated with them. In fact, each of the models that we're looking at, um, we specifically identify both advantages, potential advantages, and potential disadvantages. Model three, what we're calling constitutionalizing economic and social rights principles. And um, what we're envisaging here is the potential for uh, a Northern Ireland constitution to incorporate non-directly justiciable uh, duties on the state, so-called directive principles, to apply socioeconomic principles when making laws. And the model for that, uh, the, the uh, example of that, is both in India and in the Republic of Ireland um, with minimal uh, elements of judicial recognition in, in the Republic in particular. And we identify in the report an alternative to that um, based in, uh, in Finland. And we can go through some of the details of that in a moment if that would be useful. But let's turn to model four, which is, again, somewhat different. Um, and it basically uh, uh, envisages the idea that the assembly and the executive uh, would be under a duty to take reasonable legislative and other me measures to achieve the progressive realization of these economic and, and social rights. And the emphasis here, again, is on the assembly and the executive being given primary responsibility to decide how best to achieve that agreed aim with a, a planning uh, uh, idea envisaged. So, you know, a five-year plan or whatever. Um, well, in terms of judicial involvement here, it would be restricted to essentially judicial review of the reasonableness of the plan that was brought forward by the uh, Assembly and the Executive. Last model, um, which is uh, the idea of incorporating economic and social rights through uh, future trade agreements. Um, obviously, that's in uh, everyone's mind in terms of the future relations agreement that's currently being negotiated um, and um, whether or not the United Kingdom um, agrees to implement a basic set of uh, economic and social rights as a condition for that agreement being concluded. But we're envisaging here that the issue of how far, if at all, to incorporate economic and social rights in uh, future trade agreements, so-called trade conditionality, um, is something that's going to run and run, I suspect, um, after, um, after the transition period, uh, irrespective, in a sense, of, of the EU-UK future relations um, agreement. And the Assembly will, of course, be aware that in the white paper of um, February 2019, the UK government announced that the devolved administrations uh, would be involved um, in um, making recommendations as to future international trade policy. Though I have to say that um, has been thrown into some question by the effects of the internal markets bill, which we uh, might want to return to in further discussion. So those are the five models. Last point I want to make is that these models address several common objections to incorporating economic and social rights. And there are three, there are three objections that are often made. Um, one is the vagueness of the rights. Second, and critically, I think, um, that it's regarded as undermining political responsibility, particularly for budgetary and distributional issues. And third, that it's unsuitable for judges. And what we're suggesting here is that um, the models, separately and together, actually, um, address each of these different objections in somewhat different ways. So vagueness is addressed in Model 2 by the need for specification of particular pieces of legislation. Undermining political responsibility, we've seen that each of the um, elements in the models uh, stresses political responsibility rather than undermining it. And thirdly, in terms of it being unsuitable for judicial decision making, we've seen that in each of them, the judicial uh, role is minimized and to some extent uh, removed entirely in some of them. So finally, we don't think of these models as alternatives to each other. Rather, we think of them as identifying 
what might be called building blocks, which can provide the material for um, a new approach. So this is what we're envisaging here with declaratory principles as a potential um, at one end of the spectrum, full enforceability at the other, and these different models um, fitting in between those two um, ends of the spectrum. So I'll, I'll end at that point, if I may, and um, be very happy to take um, further discussion and um, questions. Thank you very much um, for, your, for your time this afternoon, both of you, and, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I suppose it was probably quite different to a lot of the presentations we've had this, this far, just in terms of how practical it, it was, and in terms of you, know, you, you weighed up pros and cons and, and how different things would, would take shape. Just wanted to ask some questions, and I suppose leading on from one of the last points you'd made about the Internal Market Bill and obviously trade arrangements, and, and that's very much topical at the minute. Just when you mentioned in terms of the first model and the fact that it would be putting responsibility on the Assembly here and uh, requiring ministers to act and to insert economic and social rights into, into legislation and that scrutiny role for a committee, as, as you, you have suggested. I think that the Internal Market Bill and, as you commented there, the, the UK government had obviously said devolved administrations would have a, a role and maybe we're seeing that that hasn't quite come to pass. What impact do you think that that's going to have on, on how practically something like that would work, particularly when you consider that, I mean, Stormont administration has fallen and risen again many times, um, the, the practical implications of that? Um, Kevin uh, uh, suggested that I might lead off on some of, the, uh, on some of these questions um, and, and he'll chip in as necessary. Um, so um, the, the question about the effect of the uh, internal market bill is obviously um, we, we have yet to see its final uh, shape. Um, and so I'm, I'm speaking about it, obviously, in the context of um, its non-final form. Uh, as it's uh, constructed at the moment, there are um, three potential difficulties with it in terms of some of the issues that we're talking about uh, today. Um, the, the first is, of course, the most controversial element, which is the um, willingness and ability um, to override um, both international and domestic law um, in certain circumstances. And that's what's attracted most of the adverse publicity, not, not least from, uh, from the European Commission. So to the extent that we're talking about economic and social rights as uh, arising in part from international legal obligations of the United Kingdom, um, the Internal Market Bill does not send a, a, a very good message about the willingness of, of um, the United Kingdom in certain circumstances to abide by those international obligations. So that's one problem. Second problem that arises is that um, in terms of making the uh, suggestions about potential models, we've assumed that um, uh, the executive and the assembly would have the full range of devolved powers available to it that it has at the moment. Um, and uh, parts of the uh, internal market bill um, appear, and this is the reason for a lot of the complaints arising from Scotland in particular, uh, would undermine the ability of the Assembly and the Executive um, to have the full range of discretion, discretionary powers available to it um, that it has at the moment because um, there seems to be uh, powers being taken by the central uh, government, by, by Westminster, Whitehall, um, to um, intervene in devolved areas, particularly through funding uh, mechanisms. Um, which may have the um, effect of um, uh, taking over or um, uh, interfering with the ability of um, the devolved administrations to exercise their current powers. There's a third problem, um, just to, to be complete, if I may, um, about the Internal Market Bill, and that um, also relates to the question about rights. Um, so you'll be aware that um, Article 2 um, of the um, um, protocol, the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, um, specifies that um, there should be no diminution of rights um, arising from the uh, 
exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union. Um, and that non-diminution requirement for both human rights and equality rights um, is um, specified with greater particularity in Annex uh, 1 of the protocol, um, which lists a series of uh, European Union directives in the equality area. And the commitment is given in Article 2 um, by the British government that um, if there are changes to that list of equality directives um, subsequently from the European Union, so if one of them is replaced, for example, by the European Union with another directive, it'll be that new directive that applies in Northern Ireland. Um, but that'll have to be legislated for um, in order to keep up the um, standards. Um, and the problem that the Internal Market Bill gives rise to, at least on one reading, um, is that um, those pieces of legislation updating equality legislation in order to conform to the uh, Article 2 requirement of the protocol uh, um, is potentially challengeable because it gives rise to differences between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. And um, another part of the bill, um, dealing in particular with the non-discrimination principle uh, operating between the different parts of the United Kingdom, seems to envisage that these differences could be challengeable as directly or indirectly discriminatory um, because it would give rise to differences uh, in trading arrangements between um, uh, Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. So those are the uh, – uh, I'm sorry I've gone on at, at such length um, – uh, chair, but those are the difficulties that the internal market bill um, appears to me to give rise to. How far are they going to be resolved? Um, obviously, there's quite a lot of debate uh, yet to happen in the uh, in the House of Lords. How far they're going to be resolved, um, we we will have to wait and and see. But it does cause um, some um, difficulties um, on each of those uh, elements for um, what the assembly might be able to do. I'll stop at this point and wait for uh, Kevin to chip in if, if he'd like. Yeah, no, just largely to say I would agree with Chris's interpretation or his reading of the Internal Market Bill and some of the difficulties that it would create for human rights protections and the role of the, the Assembly and some of the models that, that are here, particularly the, the conditionality one. I think um, the the devolved autonomy question is really uh, the, the big one for not just the Assembly, but um, the Parliaments and Assemblies in Wales and Scotland as well, because it really does, the Internal Market Bill really does drive a coach and horse to the idea of devolved, devolved autonomy in that sense. Um, as Chris has already outlined, some powers would be undermined. And this is in the context of already having a substantive conversation about establishing common frameworks this new legislative frame that puts in place the idea of mutual recognition and non-discrimination for goods uh, coming in, in into Northern Ireland is is quite difficult from a human rights point of view, as Chris says, because of the the non-diminution provisions in Artic, Article one, Article Two and Annex One of of, of the Protocol. Um, because if those, for instance, and, and this is again the interpretation that yeah, if the if the directives are updated, will they fall within the definition of being substantially updated and therefore fall under the the, the preview of, of the of the non discrimination provisions and therefore excluded um, from being updated in Northern Ireland? And that is a fundamental condition of the protocol in terms of how how it applies. So there are huge concerns about that, and that's setting aside even the the sort of uh, section forty seven con concerns about. The undermining the, the European Convention on Human Rights and how it applies uh, in terms of the protocol as well, which the Human Rights Commission and Equality Commission have already um, raised concerns about. And I suppose an added thing to, to think about, Chair, is also, and you, you may be coming on to this, but the, the, the added complexity of what other rights we're losing in terms of uh, our move out of, out of the EU and how, I suppose, there's potential for the for the Bill of Rights maybe to fill some of the, those vacuums. And I think that is a sort of added complexity that maybe needs to be considered within the, the context of some of the, your Bill of Rights deliberations as well. And I know you've had other experts give evidence on that, but it's certainly another element of, of the uh, exit from the EU process and the end of transition period that, that would, would be useful to consider in, in your deliberations. Thanks, Kevin. I, a couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation from Daniel Holder 
and he had spoken sort of at length about the fact that it was his view that a, a Bill of Rights here potentially could have prevented some of the, the breakdowns in Stormont that we've had and also some issues that have arisen out of Brexit and out of COVID-19. And obviously the remit of this committee is to consider the creation of a Bill of Rights as per 1998 agreement, the particular circumstances of the North and then considering Brexit and the impact that that, that, that w is going to have. So I suppose what you've talked about there sort of leads me into my next question. You know, the Internal Market Bill is one element of it and how the British government have handled it thus far have caused concerns for the devolved administrations. But just in the wider context of Brexit and what that means in terms of us losing the Charter and how uh, EU directives potentially will be lost or will not be updated in the future, there, there is a role there I would... I, I think I am safe in assuming you feel that there is a role there for a Bill of Rights for the North in, in plugging some of those gaps. So, um, yeah, uh, Kevin, I'm sure will 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 want to uh, will want to come in on this one as as well. Um, so, um, one of the um, uh, th there are lots of uncertainties about about all of this. Um, one of the uncertainties is how far um, the um, negotiations that are currently taking place between um, the UK and the EU, you know, literally uh, as we're sitting here, um, those negotiations in part involve what are called the level playing field requirements. Um, and um, several of the level playing field requirements um, in terms of labor rights, in terms of environmental rights, um, are um, critical to uh, several of the economic and social um, rights issues that we've been talking about today. So where those, uh, where the United Kingdom to agree to the current proposals from the European Commission, then um, the, uh, um, that agreement would underpin um, those rights in Northern Ireland and, and throughout the, the United Kingdom, of course. In the absence of an agreement, um, then several of the um, uh, underpinning uh, the, the underpinnings of those rights by European Union law will go, um, particularly in terms of, of labour rights, um, but also environmental rights, and to the extent that, that environmental rights are critical um, to, um, to economic and social rights, they're obviously of, of considerable concern here. So, um, so one, uh, one uncertainty is, will the future relations agreement fill the gaps that are going to be left by the European, uh, by the UK leaving the European Union. That's one element. You mentioned, uh, Chair, the, the role of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, and the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights um, goes as a matter of it being a, a part of um, UK law. And that's specifically in the uh, Withdrawal Act that Parliament passed. However, um, uh, and I'm sorry if this is uh, complicated again. However, uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights remains in Northern Ireland with regard to how the other parts of the protocol are to be interpreted and applied. So in other words, there are parts of the Ireland, Northern Ireland protocol that specify that EU law will apply in Northern Ireland. Those elements of EU law that apply in Northern Ireland have to be interpreted according to the way that the European Court of Justice would interpret those rights. That includes, therefore, the need to interpret those rights as incorporating the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So in that sense, Northern Ireland is going to have a continuing role for the Charter of Fundamental Rights that the rest of the UK will not have because aspects of European law will apply directly um, in Northern Ireland. So the reason I've, I've spelled these, uh, this out is that um, the role for a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights in filling gaps left by the UK leaving um, is going to be determined by what those gaps are 
Um, and it's not going to be entirely clear until the end of the um, negotiations that are currently in play at the moment um, how far there are going to be these gaps that are going to have to be filled by either legislation um, or by uh, a Bill of Rights. My apologies again for going on at length, but you'll appreciate that these are pretty complicated questions, and I'm happy to take further questions on that. The, the only thing I'll, I'll add to that, Chair, is that I suppose historically, uh, and the, your committee will, will be aware of this, is that the role of the EU in terms of uh, human rights and equality standards in, in Northern Ireland and, and, and through the Assembly has been substantive. Um, the, 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 I suppose the inability to reach political consensus historically in the Assembly on rights and equality issues has, has uh, I suppose, been problematic in that sense in that perhaps some of the more substantive developments in terms of uh, rights moving upwards have come not through the vehicle of uh, local assembly legislation or uh, via Westminster directly, but uh, the remit of our membership of, of the EU. And we've seen that in uh, circumstances where new EU directives or amended EU directives have come into play uh, Northern Ireland's uh, legislation or Westminster legislation that is applicable in Northern Ireland has to be read in compliance with um, that those new directives or those new um, uh, regulations. So I think that's an important point to remember in when we're considering what rights need to be to be included. And I absolutely agree with everything that Chris Chris has said. And we almost need to see where the cards fall as regards the gaps that are created uh, in terms of how the as well how the the Charter Fundamental Right. Uh, or doesn't apply to some of the, the, the protocol provisions um, uh, and, how, and what else is left that, that, that doesn't have a, a link to the, to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I think, therefore, there could be and should be a role to replicate the, and fill those gaps or even replicate potentially some of the protections that are already there in the protocol itself. There's no reason why those couldn't be potentially replicated as well. I think you've already heard um, probably from the Equality Coalition about other areas where um, the gaps could be filled, including those uh, issues around identity and rights to identify in terms of citizenship um, that were largely ignored for many years because of the freedom of movement provisions under EU law, but have now come into stark contrast because of the, the gaps that are created under our exit from the EU. So there's an all, also an opportunity to really fill those gaps as well. Um, so I think, yes, exploring the, the, the potential within the Bill of Rights, uh, and we're actually as part of the remit of, of this committee. So that, that is an important uh, aspect. Thank you. I, I suppose from, from my reading of the report that you had provided, the, there was a suggestion of passing laws um, to, to cover elements from the Charter that, that we would potentially be losing. And I, I sort of understood that that would have to happen before the end of the transition period. Sure. Uh, but... I'm not. I'm not sure if that's if that's correct, or if you're saying that there's that there's wriggle room for us after that. So, um, so if if the if the desire is, if the preference is uh, not to have any gap of coverage um, in terms of the application of the the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, then obviously that gap would have to be filled um, between now and the end of the transition period because after the end of the transition period, there will be changes in terms of the application of the Charter. Um, what I've um, su been suggesting is that um, uh, the, uh, the application of the Charter will not cease entirely in Northern Ireland after the transition period, as it will in the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, and um, therefore, um, the extent of the gap that needs to be filled is unclear until we know for sure what areas of European Union law or equivalents are going to be required as a result of the uh, forthcoming, we hope, agreement uh, on future relations. There's nothing to stop, however, um, the uh, Assembly taking action 
with regard to um, the filling of gaps after the transition period. There's, no, there's nothing that affects the Assembly's powers there, one way or the other. And so if, the, if the, the preference is not necessarily to fill the gaps immediately, of course you can take, the Assembly can take its time and decide where exactly those gaps are and how best to, to fulfill them, how, how best to, to, to fill them, whether or not that's before or, or after the, the uh, transition period. That, that's fine. Thank you. The only other, my last question is just uh, in setting out uh, the context in the paper you talked about sort of party political differences and I suppose the lack of um, politi political consensus around economic and social rights specifically in terms of having a, a Bill of Rights and obviously this is a political process now this ad hoc committee. I just wondered if you had any ideas around how we address those things. Uh, I'm, I'm not a politician, Chair. Sure. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, um, so I'm, I'm going to be, you know, re relatively cautious here. Um, here's, here's a couple of ideas. Um, so, um, if, if the opposition to economic and social rights. Um, in a Bill of Rights or more broadly, um, is because there is opposition to those rights themselves. Um, so if, for example, the argument is we should pull out of the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, then there's nothing in our report that um, is going to be persuasive to those who oppose economic and social rights. So we haven't sought to make an argument as to why so social and economic rights are a good idea or a bad idea. We've assumed that uh, the Assembly and that the United Kingdom will want to um, comply with its international obligations with regard to economic and social rights. Yeah? So in other words, if the opposite political opposition is to the rights themselves, then um, I, I'm not sure we've got very much to say to that. Um, if, on the other hand, the opposition to economic and social rights is for some secondary set of reasons to do with the fact that the judges shouldn't be involved or to do with the fact that politicians shouldn't be replaced in the process or the concern that the politicians are going to be undermined, which is, uh, I have to say, uh, quite a lot of what I hear um, when people oppose uh, economic and social rights being incorporated, or the idea that they're too vague and so vague that they're worthless, those kinds of, of arguments. If those are the concerns, then um, we're suggesting that the report that we've produced um, could be helpful in unblocking some of the uh, concerns, in, in addressing some of those concerns by saying that it's not a binary process. It's not, you know, you either have um, economic and social rights that are purely declaratory or that you have economic and social cultural rights that have all the bells and whistles uh, attaching to them in terms of full justiciability that um, the uh, Human Rights Committee recommended. We're saying uh, it's not a binary choice here. There, there is um, a set of um, alternative ways of dealing with these kinds of rights that actually reinforce political engagement, um, that reinforce um, the role of, of politicians, that make them really quite specific and, and don't render them to be vague, that doesn't involve the potential difficulties um, of ju judicial involvement. So it's to try to loosen up the process um, to say that there is, um, you know, I've, I've used the analogy before in another context, that think of this as a kind of set of Lego bricks um, that you can build various structures with. Um, and some of those structures uh, will look quite different to the kind of orthodoxy that um, uh, um, um, others will want to put forward. So that's, that's point one. Um, loosen up the process. There are alternatives. It's not a binary choice. Second suggestion, I, I think, um, is that um, I wonder whether COVID ch has changed the atmosphere. 
in the sense that the kinds of economic and social rights that we're talking about here, rights to education, rights to health, um, rights to um, um, uh, work, those kinds of rights that are deeply engaged uh, in the concerns about the effects of COVID on us, those are the kinds of rights that seem to me pretty clearly to cover everyone in Northern Ireland. Uh, and to the extent that, that rights talk in Northern Ireland has unfortunately, I think, become highly toxic because it seems to be identified with one community rather than another, so that it has become to a degree sectarianized and toxic. Um, ironically and paradoxically and, and unfortunately, in a sense, the COVID um, pandemic and its effects, I think has re-emphasized in uh, lots of quarters the idea that maybe some of these rights are rights that apply to all of us. Um, and in that sense, it may serve to detoxify um, these rights. So for example, the right to education that we talk about all the time now, the children have the right to be educated and that we shouldn't be depriving them of that. Hence the reason why the schools um, are being kept open all the time. Uh, and, and that's absolutely right. But that goes across the communities uh, in a way that perhaps the other rights of other more traditional civil and political rights um, have been seen, I think incorrectly, but nevertheless have been seen um, as being associated with, with particular communities' claims. Quickly on that, Chair, um, I would agree with everything that Chris has said. My, my one sort of addition to that really would be um, the idea, and similar to what Chris is saying about uh, Lego bricks, is, is the idea of creativity. Um, really, that's what we're hoping this 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 um, report can can bring to the table. I think where there are problems, where there are anxieties, where there are concerns, um, uh, sort of mental roadblocks, as opposed. I suppose, in terms of uh, economic social rights or their enforcement, I suppose uh, my appeal would really to be sort of uh, think creatively in, in the same way that, 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 that Chris is talking about. We've only put five models on the, Chris's team has only put five models on the table here, but there are any number of models and any number of solutions that could be developed. And I suppose it's a case of really just doing the, the legwork in terms of the scrutiny around those models and the problems and how solutions could be found. Um, I think an analysis of the of the Human Rights Commission's um, original advice would be very helpful as well, because I think if in detail some of the, the concepts that they're putting forward, um, it's not a simple sort of binary choice around, you know, um, legalizing um, economic social rights. There are limitations and manners in which economic social rights uh, apply. There are things like progressive realization. There are co minimum core obligations. There are there are legal duties that are placed on public authority. So I think it is about a process of, 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 of analyzing what those recommendations are. And if there are anxieties or concerns about explore the, the alternative models and where, where, where consensus could be reached, because I think that's how you will you will reach a, a model of a Bill of Rights that can uh, create that, that political consensus. The only thing to add, Chris, uh, I, I, I agree in one sense with this is, is concept of the toxicity around uh, some of the debates, but at a public and community level, um, we sense and we've always sensed that there is there, the community are, are, are with you in terms of trying to, to reach consensus on this issue because economic and social rights, as Chris says, even you know, before COVID, were the rights that had the greatest amount of consensus and support at a community level across Northern Ireland. So people want to see uh, their politicians reaching agreement on these type of rights because they are exactly the type of rights that people are more conscious about, uh, are most conscious about in, in their day-to-day -day lives. So finding a, a workable solution um, would find the support and will continue to find the support of, of the public in that regard. Brilliant. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to pass now to the Vice Chair, Mike. Tear away. Chair, thank you. Chris and Kevin, thank you very much for, uh, for your engagement. Be before I discuss the five models you've given to us, I'd like to, to deal perhaps with the context. Um, 
And I'm not arguing that this is a good or a bad thing because I accept that uh, the environment has changed a lot since 1998, not least because of Brexit. But in discussing economic and social rights, are we not immediately going beyond the intent of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which, as I understand it, was to say we've got the European Convention on Human Rights, and then what we want to do is decide whether there are any further rights which would reflect the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And if there are particular circumstances, they're more likely actually to be cultural than economic or social. So uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. Um, so um, you know we're we're immediately into the debate about what are the particular circumstances in in Northern Ireland, um, and um, you'll have seen uh, I hope when when you've read the report that there is a kind of um, you know t a touching of our cap towards that issue, in the sense that we say at one point um, that um, access to some of these rights. Um, um, has been uh, a recurring issue, let's put it that way, in the Northern Ireland context. Now, it's obviously up to the, to the committee to decide whether or not the, um, uh, these types of rights um, are addressing issues that are um, uh, arising out of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. I I'd suggest that there are, but, but I know that there are you know, people in, in good faith that, uh, and quite reasonably, that are suggesting that they're not. That, that's up to you to uh, that's up to you to deal with. Um, whether or not the um, you know those who were negotiating the Belfast Agreement had in mind a, a economic, social, and cultural rights um, as being potential areas uh, to explore in terms of the particular circumstances in the Bill of Rights, I I think it. Uh, I wasn't there um, at the negotiations, so I, I don't know. My guess is, um, but it's a guess, is that all the research that's now being done um, on um, the negotiations uh, in, in uh, the Good Friday Agreement indicate that um, at the last minute, various things were put into the agreement um, that were perhaps not fully thought through in terms of their implications. Um, and that there was a sense of exhaustion and a sense of um, let's get this done um, in a way which enables us to move on and to get an agreement uh, without necessarily having a full, complete understanding of what exactly was being um, agreed. I suspect that um, those who were negotiating it didn't really think very hard about whether economic, social and cultural rights were going to be included um, in uh, uh, the, the Bill of Rights context. I, I suspect some did and some didn't. Um, what one then, you know, what, what one derives from that, I'm not sure. We are where we are, um, which is that uh, th there is a, a discussion about a Bill of Rights um, in the context of an international understanding, certainly about rights, it would be strange not to include economic uh, and, and social rights in, in that context. Not least um, because the, the distinction between civil and political rights and economic, social, uh, and cultural rights, indeed, um, is is wafer thin if it's there at all. Um, and so, you know, I think it would be um, putting too much weight on this kind of conceptual distinction um, for it to be um, regarded as hermetically sealed from um, civil and political rights. I mean, we can, we can talk about this in, in more detail, but I, I would uh, resist the idea that there is this sharp distinction. But Kevin may have, have uh, 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 an additional view on it. No, no, I would, I, I would agree. I think, I think uh, Mike, there's, there is a danger. Uh, there's an opportunity, but also a danger of getting, being too restricted by you know the, the the letter of the law and our interpretations around what that paragraph in in the Good Friday a, a Agreement says, you know, um, processes like the Bill of Rights Forum. I know Christopher was part of that um, conversation. Wasted. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Christopher Stalford, uh, who's on the committee. Chris uh, wasted months talking about the interpretation and the various arguments around what we define as particular circumstance. You know, we would make arguments that there are clear um, uh, overlap with social and economic rights in terms of our particular circumstances in Northern Ireland. There's, there's, there's 
to reports and and um, and, uh, and background research that could sort of show evidence of that. But again, there, if people want to interpret particular in, in, in a certain way, they will do so. Um, and I think the danger is that we get drawn into debates about what particular words and phrases mean and overlook the opportunity that is presented by by a Bill of Rights. And we've you know, largely for the last 10 years overlooked that opportunity or not taken that opportunity. If you're starting from the point of view, as Chris says, that you know you're 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 ignoring, you're not interested in economic social rights. Well, this is this is a moot point. But if you're starting from the point of view of um, how do we best protect rights in Northern Ireland, how do we in fact make Northern Ireland a world leader in terms action of rights, then you have to consider those economic and social rights protections because they are supplementary to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is largely um, a civil political rights document. And the international standards that we could draw upon have are, 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 are have many uh, obviously uh, economic and social rights documents and covenants at, at a UN level that are that are that are, are, are assumed part of the wider sort of international standards around human rights that the UK itself has signed up to, um, and in, and in many cases we are actually in violation uh, according to the UN of those rights by not implementing those economic and social rights in legislation. And there have even been calls at the UN Review Committees to implement the Bill of Rights as a mechanism to do that. But I suppose it's, it's it, I would just, a note of caution about getting too caught up in, in the wording because it can be interpreted whatever way you want, unfortunately, um, to limit or, or to expand this process. And as a human rights organization, we really want to see the widest suite of protections that can be available to, to individuals and for us that includes economic and social rights but we are very conscious that this debate has been stalled precisely because of some of these questions and conversations so i suppose this report is really an attempt to try and um, remove some of those anxieties and sort of move the debate or push the debate on if it were so um, that would be our position on on that question there's perhaps, if I may just add a footnote, uh, Mr. Ness, but there's, there's perhaps one additional point that, that's worth bearing in mind, and that is that the, the terms of reference for, the, for your committee, of course, also refers to um, the impact of, of, of Brexit. Um, and in that context, it does seem to envisage that um, some of the economic and social rights that we've been talking about, workplace rights, for example, that are going to be affected um, th that is clearly within the remit of this committee. Um, so, so whether or not it's within the remit, as it were, of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland envisaged 1998, as you rightly said in, your, in, in the introduction to your question, um, Brexit has changed all of this. And so uh, whether or not it was central to uh, concerns in 1998 when uh, we were within the European Union, it's certainly um, a, a matter of, of current concern given that we are exiting. Chris, you, you mentioned, for example, um, the right to education, and you defined it as the right to be educated. Uh, you've twice made reference to the right to health. Now, you, you could spin that as, does that mean the right to access a national health service, or does it mean a right for an individual to be healthy? Because if it's the latter, does that not have implications, for example, for people who smoke, uh, for people who are overweight, for people who consume too much alcohol. So, um, so, so I would I would love to have a discussion um, about um, the interpretation of, of the right to health. Um, uh, not not least because it is uh, now quite extensively developed in terms of the types of questions that, that you're raising. Um, so, for example, there was a debate in Canada. Um, in, in terms of the right to health, um, whether or not it required uh, the ability to have private health insurance and so on. So in other words, the, the right to health can be taken in, uh, in different directions. Right? So if, if the thrust of your question is there's an interpretation that has to be given to the notion of the right to health, uh, that's absolutely clear uh, and absolutely right. So, so the question that, that I think flows from that uh, underlying concern here is what do we do about the fact that it has to be interpreted? And what we're suggesting in the report is that there are various ways in which 
uh, we can give greater content to it. One of them is the judicial, right? So we put all of this into the judicial context. Uh, we present them with a right to health and we say, you make of it what you will. Borrow from the international experience and so on. But it's up to the judges. And we're suggesting that there is an alternative. We're suggesting that the kind of question that you've raised uh, might be considered in the context of a political process. Now, you know, there are obviously um, different ways of interpreting it. Um, and one of them is that there should be a national health service. Obviously, if you're in the United States, the notion of a national health service um, is not the common interpretation um, of, of a right to health. It's closer to your second interpretation. So we have to understand, obviously, then the context in which those questions are going to be considered. Not the right to health doesn't necessarily mean the same thing in all uh, jurisdictions. So it has to be to some degree tailored to each particular jurisdiction and particular circumstances, to use that phrase, um, of, uh, of Northern Ireland, given that we do have a national health service. So I think you're drawing, you're trying to draw me into uh, uh, making, a, a, again, a binary choice. Is it one or the other? And I'm, su I'm suggesting to you that, first of all, we need a process for trying to determine how to answer the question before we begin to answer it. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually suggesting it's very complex. <laughs> Because, Absolutely. you know, for example, you could have a consultant who says you need a procedure, but I'm not going to give it to you until you stop smoking. Sure. Or you could be saying I'm going to the courts because smoking is legal and you're trying to stop me. Yes. Uh, if, 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 uh, if the question is, is this really complex? The answer is yes. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. In, in terms of, of the five options, You've given us the range from at one side, one end declaratory, at the other side fully enforceable. Is it possible to have both in that a preamble to a Bill of Rights could be declaratory or aspirational, but then the main body uh, would have judiciable uh, specific rights? Y yes, of course. Great, okay. <laughs> and just final that, question is... That doesn't, resolve, that doesn't resolve the dilemma here, right? No. Of, of those who are objecting to full justiciability. And, and we're suggesting that um, even if you were to go for a preamble there and, and rejected full justiciability, you would still have other alternative options um, that, uh, that you might want to think about. In other words, um, objecting to justi justiciability, objecting to the, all the bells and whistles, doesn't get you off the hook of trying to determine whether there are other ways of skinning the cat, if you want to put it crudely. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, fi final point is, is option five, um, just reading it for the first time, is it a kind of version of the McBride principles? Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, uh, no, I think it, it isn't um, for the following reasons, and that is that um, the McBride principles were a, a set of principles, as, as, uh, as I remember them, that were agreed by, um, if you like, civil society in the United States, a combination of religious groups and Irish American groups. Um, and um, they were um, then adopted by various states, particularly uh, in terms of their investment decisions particularly um, uh, in terms of putting pressure on um, some of the large pension funds. So that was all essentially private um, operational codes of practice. Um, what is being envisaged in the fifth option is rather that it would be agreed um, as part of an internationally binding trade agreement or an, indeed an investment agreement. So McBride never really got to that kind of um, uh, position. Um, it, 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 rather, it was the opposite. It was that um, the British government argued that the McBride principles in various ways breached um, international trade agreements, or potentially at least breached them. Okay, I think I'm going to dis disagree in terms of, I think the similarity is that, that both are saying we will not do business with you unless. 
Oh, um, sorry. If that's if that's the the the, the question, my, my my apologies. If if that's the thrust of the question, um, then um, uh, the the similarity is this, uh, Mr. Nesmith. The, the, the similarity is that it is linking um, economic decision making with human rights. Yeah. To that extent, yes, I understand the thrust of your question. Perfect. Chris and Kevin, thank you both very much. Thank you, Chair. My questions in relation to consensus and particular circumstances have been well covered, so thank you. I'm fine. 100%. I can see that Paula has indicated. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you, gents, for coming along this afternoon. Um, in some ways, my questions follow on from Mike's. Um, I, I was late to the meeting because our health committee meeting went on a bit late and one of the pieces of correspondence we'd received was from um, the health minister regarding transgender rights. Um, I understand what the minister was saying in the sense that there were vacancies and there were problems trying to fill them and some other sort of procedural issues in terms of um, not taking anybody new on the waiting list. So my lo this is my long-winded way of saying that, you know, in many ways, rights may not be um, realised because of other factors. And I think that's what Mike was alluding to there in terms of vacancies, not being able to find the specialists. So um, is there not the potential, and I think you used the words there around take reasonable measures to address um, re uh, uh, progressive realisation of rights. Is there not the potential that there will always be some way in which uh, uh, an executive minister can come back and say, we haven't met, the, uh, we haven't um address these rights, for want of a better phrase, because of X, Y, and Z, and nothing could really actually end up in the courts? Uh, the, the answer is uh, yes. Um, so uh, if, if, the, if the question is, um, are each of these potential, as it were, middle range models, um, do each of them have potential problems? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, that, that, that's the nature of political debate. I mean, you don't need me to tell you that. Um, what it does do, I think, however, these, these kinds of suggestions, suggested models that we've been talking about, that it begins to reorient the debate to some degree. Um, so, in other words, it is, it's, it's different, I suspect, in terms of the way that politics is debated to say... Uh, you're actually breaching a right here than to say you're breaching a policy position. Um, that's, why we, that's why we use rights, rights talk often, we say, because it, it, it emphasizes the importance of them. It emphasizes the notion that you're dealing with individuals here um, rather than a, an amorphous um, budgetary process that doesn't seem to have a direct connection with a particular person on, on the ground. So... Um, what I, I'm suggesting, I suppose, is, uh, is it going to give um, a, a definite, um, um, is it going, to, ha is it going to, to, to present those who want to criticize the minister um, because of the difficult decisions that the minister has to face? Is it going to present um, a, a way of dealing with the ministerial um, um, uh, objections in a knockdown manner? And the answer is no. But it may reorient the debate. It may make ministers more sensitive to the fact that they're going to have to consider those questions when they're devising the policy in the first place. So it gives a set of tools to those who seek to interrogate the minister's views. If I could give you, uh, uh, Ms. Bradshaw, just one, one kind of example here. So um, getting back to, to Mr. Nesmith's point about, about health, um, or indeed about transgender rights. So once they're thought to be rights, once you're borrowing from the notion of these rights as being internationally protected, then you've got a whole set of interpretive principles and a whole set of precedents and jurisprudence um, that can be used to pin that, uh, to interrogate the decision maker. Have you considered this? Have you considered that? Have you considered the implications here? So there's a whole toolbox that you're provided with 
to enable you to better implement the basic right. It doesn't have to be always at the level of vagueness. It doesn't have to be at the level of reinventing the wheel. The whole point of them being internationally protected is that they're also internationally debated and debated between countries. So you have that toolbox at hand um, if you want to use it. I suppose the concern would be that we will be building up expectations amongst some people that, that their rights, as they would see them, and, and we will always be able to look at um, inter international instruments and say, well, my right fits in under that. So I suppose that would be my concern. Um, but just moving on to the second question, and as the um, as we just stated there, Christopher was in the Bill of Rights, but I was as well, the Bill of Rights form all those years ago. Um, could you give us an understanding, really, and I don't mean this to be a contentious question, but whose rights and in what ways have rights in Northern Ireland been undermined in this um, gap or the last 22 years or take it back into uh, 2008? You know, what rights have been undermined and not been realised in those 12 years because we haven't had a, um, a Bill of Rights in place? That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. The, uh, uh, let me just uh, link it to your last point that you made about expectations. Um, and uh, the, 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 the question, is this going to give rise to expectations? Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, it, it, it should give rise to expectations. In other words, um, the, the, remember these international, these, these uh, rights are agreed already internationally. The United Kingdom has already signed up to them uh, as, as binding international commitments. So the expectations should already be there in terms of the population. They should know about these rights. They should know that they are internationally protected. They should know that their government has signed up to, 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 uh, to implement them. So in terms of then of your, your second uh, uh, follow-up question, um, one, way, one brief way of answering the question um, is to look at the reports of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee um, that has examined um, uh, the United Kingdom um, and examined in that context Northern Ireland, um, or to look at the reports of the uh, spe special rapporteurs um, on extreme poverty, for example, that has recently reported, or to look at the reports um, of the Committee on um, Social Rights of the Council of Europe. There you have um, a whole set of reports over the last 20 or so years um, that you know, Kevin will, will know uh, as well as I do, that sets out in various ways um, how various um, rights have been let slip in terms of how they're being implemented, whether those are rights applying to asylum seekers or whether they're rights um, dealing with uh, the right to housing in terms of rough sleeping um, or whether they're uh, rights with regard to um, uh, deficiencies in the health service and health protection. All of the issues, in fact, that are now coming home to bite us in the context of the pandemic in terms of COVID, COVID has exposed several of the areas that have been the consistent concern of those who have been seeking better implementation of economic and social rights. Um, so we can go into these in, in considerable detail, but I'd refer you to those reports as a, a, a neat way of summarizing um, several of the kinds of concerns that we've been, uh, we've been suggesting. Kevin, but you may well have a view on this as well. Yeah, I suppose uh, it's a really good question, Paul. I think um, one of the things from our perspective is that, you know, the, the lack of a sort of rights framework or a way of talking about rights or taking forward progressive rights in Northern Ireland has really barred us from even keeping pace with the rest of the UK and what is happening in other jurisdictions that are, that are, that are neighbours. Um, I, I mentioned previously that you know, the EU have really sort of raised us up by the bootstraps over the last sort of 10, 20 years in terms of progressing or keeping pace with the EU protections. But at a UK level, a level, we've really fallen behind the pace of development in that regard. Back in 1998, we were, I suppose, leading the debate with the establishment of, of Section 75. And obviously, that, that has sort of, in terms of realising sort of uh, progressive rights, that has really failed in, in many people's regard. 
a perspective. But if you look at some of the other developments that have taken place um, across the UK, Northern Ireland, because of this you know, issue of lack of political consensus, really hasn't been able to match the speed or the pace of those developments. So I'm thinking in particular, um, they called the Act in 2010, which really pulled together a lot of the existing equality provisions and regulations uh, across the in parts of other parts of the UK, put them together in a single uh, accessible document, and, and also enhance some of the, the equality protections uh, available to individuals. Um, we simply weren't able to do that in Northern Ireland. We, there were campaigns and conversations about a single Equality Act um, to pull together those protections in a similar document, and that simply wasn't achievable because of a lack of, of political consensus. But also similarly, in recent years, we've seen developments at a devolved level, and I know you've heard evidence about this already, in Wales and in Scotland, where some of those international standards that do incorporate inter economic and social rights have been incorporated, incorporated into domestic, um, domestic legal standards and have been protected and enforceable to, to one extent or, or another. So I think that's another example of where we've really um, fallen down in terms of this being a, a barrier to, to progression. I suppose the fear really in terms of not having some element of just disability or a legal redress met is that uh, you know th there were concerns about you know does it does it judicialize rights but the flip side of without that sort of a backstop or, or I suppose um, last resort and that's bear in mind that's what most people think of it as a last resort including ourselves without that instead of judicializing rights, what you actually do is politicize rights. And that has been what has happened in Northern Ireland for so long. And that's where some of these toxic debates and binary debates that, that Chris is talking about emerge from, because you have this emerging political narrative that it is that you know, X rights are for one community or for the other, when in reality, rights are universal and should apply uh, across the board. I suppose coming back to your point about, about tra transgender healthcare, you know, that has been a long-running issue in terms of access to pro proper healthcare uh, provisions for, for, for the transgender community in Northern Ireland. And I suppose there are weaknesses uh, in all of the models that, that we've put, put, put forward, and Chris has rightly identified those, and, 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 and there are strengths in the Human Rights Commission's provisions uh, as well that, that could be and should be explored. One of those, I, I suppose, that issues that, that goes across all the models is the idea of progressive realisation. And progressive realisation means that it's not immediately realizable that it should be implemented over time. But the flip side of that is that if there aren't concrete affirmative steps being taken and proven and shown publicly to be taken, that there should therefore then be an act, the access to other models of redress, include, including judicial remedies under, under some of the models. So I think that's where, yes, we need to be careful that we don't, um, we don't uh, put together a, a Bill of Rights that does not allow um, for some element of redress um, that would make the rights effective for is after a period of time where the assembly or public authorities have a have a period to actually find the resources, implement them over time. So I think we need to be careful uh, when, when, when developing those models that we don't miss out that step because that is the step at which um, it's the thin end of the wedge in terms of uh, individuals actually accessing rights that we need to have some sort of backstop that protects them if there is no action taken at a political level or if there is no level of political consensus, because that's really where the rights uh, come into play. Um, sorry, so uh, the, I think it's I think it's a really important question, um, but I think some of the some of the some of the models um, that we've, we've or Chris has put in the paper really reflect some of those weaknesses and some of those strengths. Okay, no, no, I appreciate that. I maybe came across as if it was anti anti rights there. I'm absolutely not, you know, and I think to, coming on Saturday, we're going to have the new legislation and provisions in, in around um, removal of the defence of reasonable chastisement, because I would love to see smacking ban and something I'm working with our Justice Minister on. So, no, I, I totally take the point. Um, and so, I suppose you're right, we have to look across, but potentially those issues will maybe come through our legislative processes through the departments anyway, but uh, no, I, I very much take on board everything you've said. Paula, is that you? We also have Mark on Starleaf. Mark, you have your hand up as well. Your way. I, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Kevin and Chris, uh, for that very interesting presentation. I think it was a bit less abstract than some that, that we have received, and that's not in any way critical. Uh, 
of the others, but it was kind of a, a change of approach and, and change of, of pace. In some ways, uh, a, a lot of the stuff had could been interested and has been asked and has been answered and, and answered very well. I, I might say I was particularly interested in, in, in that point there that Kevin had made in response to Paula just there now, in terms of the politicisation of rights and, and, and sadly whenever we have a kind of zero sum approach to politics and there's also that zero pro a zero sum a, a approach to rights where where someone sees something as a right, someone else will see it a, a, as a wrong. But uh, the, the question I was going to ask, I think it was uh, Chris saying there, and it was around, I think, Model 3. I don't have the notes in front of me, sorry. But the application of socioeconomic policies in uh, making laws, and, and decided a couple of jurisdictions there, uh, Chris India, and then a bit closer to home, uh, the, the, the down south. But then the, you touched on the a different model, and I think it was Finland that you mentioned, and he says you might expound on that. I was just wondering if you possibly could. Sure, um, absolutely. The, uh, the the starting point for the um, uh, thank you, Mr. Rickman, for the for the question. Um, the starting point for the uh, the, the discussion here um, is um, uh, trying to get uh, identification of practical examples that um, don't rely on uh, uh, a purely judicialized approach. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to identify here um, um, alternatives that um, nevertheless take these rights as important, uh, that even constitutionalize them, um, but don't necessarily rely on um, the judicial enforcement of them. H however desirable that may be, in other circumstances, if we can't get a consensus around them, then we have to look at potential alternatives. So um, the starting point here was um, the approach that was adopted by, uh, by Mr. De Valera uh, in, the, uh, in the drafting of the Irish Constitution. Um, and, and he was e equally skeptical, as, as, uh, as uh, some people are now, of um, overly judicializing um, um, what he considered to be political issues. And so the, the Southern Constitution essentially divides up um, rights between those that are enforceable in the courts and those that are not. So um, what we now would call uh, economic and social rights um, are referred to in, this, in, in the Republic as directive principles. Um, and they are not judicially, directly judicially enforceable. So uh, that uh, approach that was taken of dividing up the rights into two groups, as it were, was then reflected in the, uh, in the Indian approach as well. Um, so De Valera's model was adopted uh, quite explicitly in the drafting of the Indian constitution. So we've got these two examples. The alternative model that we sketched out, um, the, the Finnish model, uh, is um, similar to some degree, um, but a bit more developed in terms of its institutional mechanisms that surround it. So the, the Finnish approach has um, a set of um, economic and social rights identified in the constitutional framework of, of Finland, um, which are set out as constitutional rights, but the legislature essentially retains a very considerable degree of control over how those rights are interpreted and enforced, right? So, you know, coming back to Mr. Nesbitt's point about health, that would be quite a good example. So we, we have a right to health that is in the constitutional structure. What does it mean? Now, the traditional answer to that is, well, you go to the courts to find out. And Finland's taken a rather different approach. Finland's saying the legislature should first of all be thinking about what that means, right? It shouldn't be simply a matter for lawyers. It should be a matter for political decision-making. You know, I, I, forgive me, I'm a lawyer, right? I, I kind of like lawyers, <laughs> but, but I realize that lawyers cannot solve all problems, uh, however much they may think they can. So the Finnish approach is to say the legislature is the first port of call here. For interpreting these rights and applying them seriously. The court and the Finnish courts do have a role, 
But essentially, they fulfill the role of what's called ex post judicial review. So after the legislature has decided what the approach is, then they can have uh, a degree of scrutiny as to whether what Finland, the Finnish legislature, has, a, uh, has agreed upon looks as if it's going to comply. And a very considerable discretion is given to the legislature to decide what these rights should mean. Okay, so very weak judicial involvement here. But here's the critical point. The critical point is that there's a very strong committee within the legislature, Constitutional Scrutiny Committee, that assesses the legislation in light of the constitutional requirements. But again, that's a politically composed committee with a strong scrutiny function. So it's not as if you simply say to the legislature, go and do what you think is wise or reasonable with regard to economic and social rights. Um, there is a backstop, and the backstop is provided by this Constitutional Scrutiny Committee. So if you're um, willing to put up with a committee of that kind that is a serious scrutiny committee that's reviewing on constitutional grounds compliance by the legislature with a constitutional requirement, then that's the Finnish model. Um, and we, we talked to um, several people uh, in, in the Finnish context um, who um, were, you know, they saw the potential problems with it, but were actually quite um, enthusiastic about the potential for it, resolving the idea that it shouldn't be over judicialized resolving the idea that there should be heavy political involvement, whilst nevertheless um, constitutionalizing these principles and therefore giving them a degree of importance in the um, political debate that they might not otherwise have. I'm not sure whether that answers your question, Mr. Durkin. Um, no, 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 uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. But see, then that scrutiny committee, that comprises of elected representatives, yeah, and it is a d democracy, obviously, so the political composition of that committee is liable to change. And have there been examples that, that, that you're aware of where the committee may have taken a particular view and then a few years and an election later, this, the, the same committee, albeit made up differently, takes a, a contradictory view on the same thing? No, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, the, uh, the, the answer I'd like to give is um, uh, we'll respond to that question in, in some detail once we check back with our sources in Finland because mm -hmm. we haven't looked at that particular question. But it, 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 it's a kind of, um, it's a way into a larger point that I want to make about future involvement, uh, which is if the committee, if your committee has these kinds of questions in terms of the detail, we would be very happy to supply answers with, uh, with research uh, and, and based on, on research as the rest of the report has been. So I can't answer your question uh, in terms of the detail that I'd like to, but I'm very, very happy to get back to you um, with, with further detail if that would be useful. No, that would be great if you could, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. All right, Mark, I can see that John is on Starleaf as well now. John, do you have any questions or comments you want to? No, I'm OK. No problem. Well, that's that's us, Chris and Kevin. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon and for uh, presenting to us and, and answering all the questions so uh, carefully and extensively. Um, Thank you very much. We'll let you go at this point. Well, thank you, and, and thank you very much for uh, saying right at the beginning that we were identifying a practical uh, approach. Uh, that's exactly what we wanted to do. And let me just reiterate the point that I, that I made to Mr. Durkin. We'd be happy to respond to any further questions or uh, be involved in any further way that the committee would uh, would find helpful. So, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Good. All right. 
Uh, members, we can now move to item three. So in chairperson's business today, um, we're covering the fact that at 4.15, and everyone should have received an email about this, uh, we're hosting a virtual launch of our new consultation on a Bill of Rights, which should be live today. This is going to be a stakeholder event, which will provide an overview of the aims of the inquiry, the consultation process, and explain how stakeholders can share their views with the committee. It would be brilliant if you could all join at the virtual launch. I know Mike has sent apologies for that. Uh, also ask at this point that all members promote the consultation using your own personal social media and uh, other networks that you have. So you'll find in your table papers, and I know they arrived quite late today, a, a draft press release and an all-party notice about the consultation launch. So if members are content, can we agree the press release and the all-party notice? I see. Paula indicating at this point. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thanks, um, Caroline and, and team for your work on, on this. Can we have a link sent through? Because in the table paper, papers, it's like a PDF almost, so you can't really copy and paste the link then. So could that really just be sent out just to our private or our MLA email accounts, please? Yeah, Caroline's saying that won't be a problem. Um, and I know it's, it's going to be on the ad hoc Twitter account and, and everything as well. So yeah, but we'll get them sent out so that everyone okay. can have the, the link and share it easily. Okay, um, item number four is our draft minutes and you'll find those at page 100 of your pack. If members are content to agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have no matters arising. Number six, we don't have any correspondence to note. And so then a forward work program, agenda item seven. That's page 106 of the meeting pack. Is everyone content? Yep. Yep. So then, if members have any other business? No. Nope. Short and sweet. So uh, the date, time, and place of our next meeting is uh, right here next week at 2, 2 p.m. And I'll now close the meeting. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.